Um, thank you so much. What a lovely introduction. I sound so much posher when you talk about me than when I talk about that. That sounds wonderful. Um, so thank you very much for indulging me and letting me rant to you about how I think laser and psychiatry can change the world. And over the next 45 minutes or an hour or whenever I run out of breath, um, I'll be trying to convince the medical students amongst you. Is there any medical students here? Yeah, that psychiatry is the best specialism and open only to the most brilliant, clever and attractive of you. And that within that, liaison psychiatry is utterly phenomenal. Sound like a plan? Nice one, let's go. So, I've also got a couple of caveats though, right? This is all other people's work. I'm about to take credit for lots and lots and lots of other people's work. Isn't that good of me? I'm so glad that very few of my team, if none at all, are here today um, because I'm just going to you know, tell them what they do and I'm going to pretend it's me. So it's always embarrassing when there's like a heckle from the back and somebody shouts, that was me that cured them. I'm like, oh, no. I was trying to pretend, Tom, I was trying to pretend. So with all of those caveats, let's, let's crack on. Here's the thing. This is the first slide where I take credit for somebody else's work. And actually, since she's here, Rachel, then one of our medical students who's in our team just now, then I have to actually credit her. Um, I asked Rachel why she likes psychiatry. And she said, I've gone that way and had a think about it. And not only have I come up with three reasons why psychiatry is brilliant, I've even made them alliterative. I thought, you're a genius. You're going to pass this bloke. The first thing is patience. And I'm going to be talking about patience a lot. But I want to be very, very clear at the beginning. When I think about patients, I'm thinking about you. And I'm thinking about me. And I'm thinking about all of us. Because we will all be patients at some point in our life. And we'll all have experience of mental illness. And some of the folk in this room just now will be mentally unwell. Of course you will. There's about 100 people here or however many. Of course some of us will be suffering from mental illness. We all have had experience of some of the stuff that I'll be talking about. And some of it will be really, really hard. And when I use the phrase patience, it will feel like I'm talking about something other, something there, something foreign, and that's not true. And I don't want our medical students, our lovely, fantastic, brilliant young people, to come into medical school and think that patients are other, because they're not. Our patients are us in a different place. And it's really important we remember that, because sometimes if we get into the habit of thinking about patients as other, or as foreign, or as something different, then it makes it a little bit more tricky to remember to be kind to our patients, or as kind as we would like. So I'll talk about patients, but when I'm talking about patients, I'm basically talking about you and me. Deal? So I love the patients that we meet in psychiatry, because I love people. I'm really interested in people, I'm, their stories, their backgrounds, where they've come from. And like the rest of medicine, we get to, in psychiatry, ask really, really nosy questions. That's basically my qualification. Higher maths and nosiness. That's how I got into this gig. So I'll be talking about patients and I'll be really enthusiastic about them. And I'll speak a little bit more about them in a second. But the other thing that I really love in psychiatry is the people I get to work with and work for. Um, the counsellors and the psychotherapists and the nurses and the doctors. And I was thinking about this, why do I love other psychiatrists so much? And it came to me in one moment. I used to work in Australia and I came back to this country and I needed a job, needed to pay the rent. So I came back to Bristol, so I'd never been here before in my entire life. And I went to an interview for a psychiatry job as a trainee. And one of the consultant psychiatrists was interviewing me. And he asked that standard interview question in medical interviews, which is, has there ever been a time where something's gone wrong maybe had an outcome that you didn't like, um, and have you reflected on it, and have you learned from it? So I remembered a time where I had made a decision about a patient, because I'd been working in psychiatry before then, made a decision about a patient, and it wasn't a wrong decision, it's just that it didn't quite work out as well as I'd hoped, and I thought about it, and I'd learned from it, and I'd reflected on it, and I gave this lovely interviewer this beautiful spiel about how much I'd learned and all the rest of it, and at the end of it he said, yes, that's very good. But how are you after all that? <laughs> I thought, you are so delicious. I've given this wonderful interview answer, which I have aced, by the way. And all they did was lean over and almost touch me and say, and how are you? That sounds really hard. And I thought, God, I want to be a psychiatrist more than ever. This is utterly marvellous. And that sort of kindness and thoughtfulness and mindfulness about the people we work with, not just the people we work for, like our patients, really sticks with me. And the other thing that's brilliant about psychiatry is the potential. Oh, 
there's still Nobel Prizes to be won in psychiatry. When I was speaking to Rachel, sorry, I'll stop picking on you now, right? But when I was speaking to her the other day, Rachel said, oh, they're about to recategorise some diagnosis in DSM-5, our Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Disease. It's like, I know, it's brilliant, isn't it? We've not even settled on the names for the stuff we see, let alone found out an idea or a complete explanation for it, never mind a management plan for it or a prognosis for it. There's loads of stuff still to be thought about and found out and explored and discovered in psychiatry. That's brilliant. And when we think that maybe that's because psychiatrists are really, really stupid, that we've not got all the answers yet, it's not that. It's just like, like lots of other professions, we are dealing with a kilogram of the most complicated matter in the known universe. You can't shout at me for not knowing all the answers. That's what we've got to deal with. And isn't that fantastic? Who wants to be a psychiatrist now? Yeah, <laughs> I've actually put people off by that show of hands, I think. So our patients. Here's the thing. I am very, very grateful to Glenicals for nominating me for this, so I have the opportunity to come and bore you. But I am not a good teacher. I'm really, really not. But my patients are. They are phenomenal. Because every day I get to learn something new about psychiatry about psychology, about medicine in general. I get to learn something new about them and their place in the world and how they fit into society or don't. And I get to learn something about me and the team that I work for and how I work and how I relate to other people. Constantly learning and constantly teaching from this magnificent group of people who happen to come to the BRI and come and see us. And it's been like that through my entire career. I've worked in lots and lots of different places, doing lots and lots of different things. And every time I think, yeah, I've got this. I know what to do now. I understand this person completely. I understand the system completely. Then something happens. They say a word or a phrase or they do something extraordinary and it makes me realise I know nothing. I know nothing. And isn't that fantastic to work for those people? Marvellous. So this is where I work. Actually, somebody told me it looked like a church where I showed up a slice. I thought, oh yeah, it does a bit. I don't work in a church. I don't work in a church. I work in a hospital because I'm a psychiatrist in a general hospital, particularly, in this case, the Bristol Royal Infirmary down the road, where I'm sure most of you will either have studied, gone to visit an a and &E on a Saturday night. We don't like it when you do that. Um, or have gone and visited patients or friends or relatives in there. I love it. And I work there three or four days a week pottering around, mooching around the wards, practicing psychiatry in the acute hospital. And it's a very, very special place to practice psychiatry. Because most psychiatry is actually practiced in the community. Most psychiatry by number is practiced by GPs doing a fantastic job in primary care. But I get to practice psychiatry in the hospital and people only tend to be in hospital when they're physically unwell. So I've got this wonderful cohort of people that I get to speak to who are in the hospital usually for a physical illness, and then they ask me to come and see them as well. My colleagues, the physicians, the surgeons, ask me to go and see them too. And this is what we do, bits and pieces. So to be a good liaison psychiatrist, and I'm not claiming to be one, um, to be a good liaison psychiatrist, you need to have a reasonably thorough knowledge of neurochemistry. Because you need to know, if I'm going to prescribe a medication, what that's going to do to your brain. And you need to have a knowledge of pharmacology, which is how all of my medication is going to interact with all of everybody else's medication. And since we not uncommonly see folk on 15, 20 medications, that's pretty cool, actually. I have to have a reasonable knowledge of pharmacology, but what I really have to have is the bleep number for a woman called Helen, who's the pharmacist at the BRI and who helps me out with all of these things. Oh, Helen, you'll never guess how many they're on this time. What can I do? What can I give them? Oh, I'll be fine. I'll sort it out. She's marvellous. But you have to have a reasonable knowledge of pharmacology. Psychotherapy. Psychotherapy, for anyone who doesn't know about it, is basically talking therapies. Whole range of them. Cognitive behavioural therapy, psychodynamic psychotherapy, supportive psychotherapy, interpersonal psychotherapy. I'm not practised at any of those, I'm not a psychotherapist, but I need to know enough about them to think what might be the best thing for my patient at that time and know where to get it. Legal frameworks, everyone thinks about psychiatrists and people think about the Mental Health Act, and that's true, I do use it very rarely. But I do use the Mental Capacity Act and I use the Children's Act. And I need to know not just what I ought to do, which is the ethics here, but I know what I can do legally and how I'm going to enforce, impinge, construct, make something happen under legal frameworks as well. 
Philosophy. I had the misfortune to go to Professor Carell's philosophy lecture, the Bob lecture, the best of Bristol lecture at lunchtime today. She's clever, eh? That depressed me in the old standard setting, by the way, when it came to these lectures. But I thought she was talking about, should, we, should one be afraid of one's own death? God, I even sound clever when I'm doing an impression of her. Um, and I just thought, that's a kind of extraordinary thing to think about, to be able to think about the philosophy of death. Because we, on a very, very superficial level, have to deal with questions about death and birth. We have to deal with questions about what is good, what is right, what somebody might want to happen in the future, what they wanted to have happened in the past. All of these little bits of philosophy. Not that I'm pretending to be a philosopher. I'm really not. But we need to be aware of it because our patients are aware of it. And that's who we're there to look after, who we're there to serve. We need to have some idea about culture. Um, because folk in Bristol come from loads of different cultures. And so what is useful and good and reasonable in one place might not be so in the other. And since some of our diagnostic criteria, the way we think about symptoms of mental illness, are culture bound, then we need to know enough about somebody's culture to say whether this is a symptom or a sign or not, or this is normal. That's okay. We can think about narrative. Narrative is interesting to me because I think people are basically storytellers and we focus on things that make sense to our story and we're able to dismiss very, very easily things that don't. So you need to think about people, we need to think about people longitudinally as the kid who was always wrong growing up or the kid who was always sick growing up or the kid who had CF, cystic fibrosis, growing up and it carries through life, of course, or the person who was always really, really independent and then something happened and they lost all of that and their narrative changed horribly, horrifically and they're having difficulty adjusting to it. And that brings into ideas of identity. Because when you go into a hospital, you're a patient and you're infantilised beautifully. We don't mean to do it, but we do. You're sent to bed, you're dressed in pyjamas, you're told when to eat, when to sleep, and sometimes when to go to the toilet. Isn't that extraordinary? Could you imagine if I did that in any other setting to any of you? If I told you what to eat, you'd tell me where to get off. Of course you would, and sometimes our patients do. Thank you very much. But we treat them differently and we change their identity. And when you see a guy who's being the big hard man, wandering around town, looking after his family, providing for them, and then suddenly because of a physical illness or because of something's happened and he's bed bound and he's lost all his muscles, he's lost all his power, he can't look after his kids, that's a massive identity change. That's a grief. That's loss of so much. And it doesn't mean that it's mental illness, but it just means that we need to be aware of it because we tie all of these things together. I've put in, as you might see here, my favourite um, therapist, which is Columbo. Columbo, for those of you who don't know, is a 1970s detective working around um, Los Angeles. And you'll see him on a Sunday afternoon in two-hour specials on Channel 5. He wears a shabby overcoat and he keeps turning around saying, just one more thing. He's absolutely fantastic. Um, and for me, he's the epitome of taking care of yourself and being kind to yourself. Because quite a lot of the time, the best diagnosis to make in liaison psychiatry is to make no diagnosis whatsoever. And to just say, oh, shh, you're having a hard time, eh? No wonder. God, look at all this stuff. You've broken your leg. Your mum's unwell. Oh, it's awful. What you need to do is go home, have a cup of tea, Take the doobie from the bed, put it on the sofa, sit down for the afternoon, watch a box set of Columbo, distract yourself, have a bobo, go to sleep, wake up, have a think in the morning. Just be kind to yourself, look after yourself. And it's become increasingly clear, like these blank faces of you attest, that people don't know who Columbo is anymore, so that's one of my major therapeutic arms completely gone. I was speaking to this young girl, um, she was like 17, and um, she'd been brought into hospital because she was not looking after her diabetes properly. She wasn't taking her insulin properly. And she wasn't taking her insulin properly because she was 17. And people who are 17 don't think they're going to die. And people who are 17 get angry with their mum and punish them by not taking their insulin. And people who are 17 forget to take it and just want to go, Ugh! and they're angry with the world because they've been given this disease that isn't their fault and all the rest of it. And I was saying, darling, 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 what you need to do is go home and watch some Columbo. And she went, right, 
I thought you have no idea who Colombo is, have you? So then we had to have a whole conversation about finding um, an appropriate televisual substitute for Columbo, which, as it turned out, this was a couple of years ago, was X Factor. So we went, yes, you must go home and you must watch X Factor. You must just do something that's appropriate, that's nice, that's kind, and not worry about this just now. This isn't your biggest problem just now. You're fine, you're safe, you just need to settle down and be kind to yourself. Isn't that a nice job to have, to prescribe television? And all of this is very good, but because we work in the hospital, <laughs> it's time critical. I wrote this and I thought, oh, this sounds really exciting, time critical. Because as a psychiatrist, what I really like to do is I like to work in a team. And I like to go and have a chat with my team, with my wonderful colleagues about saying, oh my goodness, there's this really complicated patient. Um, what are we going to do? We could do this, we could do that. I've thought about this problem here and this medication, but under the Mental Capacity Act, we could do this and we could do, oh, what should we do, what should we do? which is lovely, except when you have a surgeon at the end of the bed saying, yeah, this is fine, but they're actually bleeding quite a lot. So if we could just make a decision sooner rather than later, that would be marvellous. And it just gives an extra frisson of excitement to the whole decision-making process, to the whole therapeutic management of anyone when we've got to make a decision in a fairly short term. And this brings to mind something which we try to teach people who come to work for our team, which is you can only do the best you can do. You've got to make sure you do the best you can do, but you can only do the best you can do. And sometimes there's more than one right decision. And that right decision might change from three o'clock to five o'clock, from Monday to Tuesday, but you can only make the decision with the amount of information you've got there at the time and make it in the best interest of your patient. And sometimes there's often lots of wrong answers and there's often lots of right answers. Sometimes there's no right answer and you just have to take the least worst wrong answer. And that takes a bit of getting used to, especially when we teach our medical students that there is a right answer, that something must be done, that something can be done. Then trying to turn that on its head to say, hmm, well, sometimes the best thing to do is nothing. Sometimes the best thing to do is just the best thing you can do at the time. That is really weird. And that anxiety, that sort of um, inability to put your finger on exactly the right answer at the time, that can cause quite a lot of anxiety and distress. So we need to look after that too. But who do we see? Who are these mythical patients? And what do they do to us as clinicians? So, um, self-harm. I'm not going to ask anybody to put up their hand in this room if they self-harm, but I know you're here. And I know you're here because it's really, 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 really common. And the self-harm to the severity that people present to hospital is really common. And the self-harm to the severity that people need to be seen by a psychiatrist or a psychiatry team when they present to hospital is really common. And we are going to see about more than 2,500 presentations a year down at the BRI. And that's from folk cutting or burning or scratching or taking tablets. It's going to be people who self-harm as a way of coping. And it's going to be people who self-harm because they've tried to kill themselves. <gasps> That's not a very happy topic for a Tuesday morning, is it? When you get into work and we say, let's go down to the ED department and see all those people who have tried to hurt themselves, whose life is so difficult for them just now that they've tried to hurt themselves or even kill themselves. And here's another interesting thing. When people have used self-harm as a way of coping, then it serves a purpose and it's really difficult for them to just stop. So they might come back time and time again with self-harm. They might come back time and time again with overdoses of paracetamol or cutting. And that is obviously awful for the patient, for us, for the patient, um, because their life is so difficult at the moment. But it's also really horrible for the nurses and the doctors looking after them. Because mostly, nurses and doctors and physiotherapists, occupational therapists and everyone else, they go into medicine to fix people, to make them better. So when we can't fix someone, because they keep coming back um, with self-harm time and time again, we can often get really, really sort of disenchanted. And I'm reminded, when I think about this, of a woman, let's call her Emma. And Emma, um, if there was a prize for the number of attendances at the BRI ED, she would have won it two months running. For a couple of months there, she was coming in 60 times a, a month with self-harm. She would go out, take another overdose, come back in, go out, cut herself again, come back in. And it was really difficult for the nurses to watch her because they wanted to care about her, they wanted to make her better. But they couldn't, they couldn't fix her because this was a bigger problem than just a cut or an overdose. And so part of our job
was to help make sure that every time she came in, we treated her and everyone treated her as kindly and as thoughtfully and as nicely as we possibly could. And I know that sounds like I'm talking about an obvious thing, but it can be really difficult for watching somebody suffer time and time and time again and ask them to be as nice as the first time. But we did. And I got to know Emma reasonably well because I kept having to go to see her. And um, even I was thinking, God, I can't see a good way out of this. I just don't know what's going to happen. And there's nothing, for a variety of reasons, there's nothing in the situation that I can fix. And even I, delusionally optimistic, would have to sort of gird my loins to go, right, brilliant, let's have a chat again for the 60th time that month. Anyway, after a while, Emma stopped coming to the emergency department. And I, she dropped out of sort of psychiatry services in Bristol. And I thought she's moved. She's moved on to a hospital somewhere else. And then about a year later, the ED department at the BRI got a letter, not me, but the emergency department. And it got a letter to say, thanks. You were really, really kind to me when I needed you. I must have really annoyed you because I think I was the most frequent attender at the BRI ED for two months in a row. She, she, she counted it. She knew how many times she'd been there. Um, I just wanted to let you know that I've moved and I've moved on, I've moved to a different part of the country, I've got a nice house, um, I've gone to college, I've found a nice boy, we're engaged, we're going to be married <laughs> and I'm going to go to university and be a social worker. Thanks for being kind to me. If you want to find out how I'm getting on, here's my phone number. Yours sincerely, Emma. And you know what? Even telling you about it now makes me so tingly because this is a girl who's managed to turn her life around and all we had to do in the meantime was be consistently kind to her. But she's done that. Isn't that amazing? In the midst of the therapeutic nihilism that we can sometimes feel, I don't know how I'm going to make this person better, actually just giving them time and kindness can do so much and it made us all feel kind of warm and wonderful you don't go looking for thanks but it's really really lovely when you get it in medicine we look after people with physical um, consequences of their psychological problems and here's the thing i remember being asked to see this guy who was in his 30s three young children and he had decompensated alcoholic liver disease and he was going for transplant and he'd been sober for a few months and the hepatologist the liver doctors had asked me to see him to say look um do you think he's actually going to manage to remain sober afterwards it's a really difficult call to make there's not much evidence that i can draw on to think about it but i thought well i'll have a chat with him we'll see what we can do so I spoke to this guy and I took a full history and I asked him about growing up and what was happening. And I had to almost sit in my hands to contain myself because I was, of course, the cleverest doctor in the world. Because I was able to diagnose <laughs> social anxiety disorder. And when I say I was clever, of course I wasn't. He told me they had it. You just had to ask the right questions. This poor guy, when he was 14, had developed social anxiety disorder. And social anxiety disorder is really, really common and a significant, a significant minority, like 20% of people will go on to become alcohol dependent because alcohol is really good for anxiety. And um, a significant minority of those people will go on to develop cirrhosis, decompensate their liver and require transplant or die from social anxiety disorder. Isn't that mental? Because social anxiety disorder isn't shyness. Social anxiety disorder is an acute fear and avoidance of anywhere where you're going to be the subject of scrutiny. Now just think about that. Imagine the, the pal that sort of um, casts on your life. You can tell when somebody's got social anxiety disorder because they'll come to you and say, I'm, I'm anxious. You say, fine. Imagine you're in Tesco, in a big Tesco. Whereabouts in the shop are you anxious? Because if people have panic disorder, which is something else slightly, they'll be most anxious in the middle of Tesco because they can't escape easily out of the shop. But when you've got social anxiety disorder, it's the queue and it's the checkout that drives you batchy. Because you can't stand there, there's a whole queue of people looking at you. What if you fumble with your change? What if you get it wrong? What if your car doesn't work? There's the cashier looking at you. It's that level of scrutiny. Imagine being able to, or having to live your life where going to the shops is awful. You have to drink to go to the shops, getting on a bus where the whole bus is looking, you're getting on a train where somebody's speaking to you, let alone giving a talk like this. And how do you cope with that? Well, you use the culturally appropriate and easily available drug that is alcohol just to live. 
Imagine going to the job centre where we've got social anxiety disorder. Imagine going for a job interview in a panel of people. It's an awful, it's a blight. But of course, what he, I, and I was desperate to say, oh, I know what's wrong with you, and it's totally fixable. But um, of course, that's not what you want to hear. Because there's a real chance you're going to die and leave three children fatherless. And the last thing you want to hear is a, a doctor who's so pleased with herself that she's managed to diagnose it, saying, oh, I could have fixed you, if you were, when you were 15, if only somebody had noticed. But because of the stigma of mental illness, because of lack of education around it, he didn't notice that something was wrong. His parents didn't notice there was something wrong. His school didn't. The social worker didn't. We didn't. In society, we didn't notice there was something wrong, and now he's going for a liver transplant. That seems like a massive failure to me, doesn't it? And of course, what we actually did was say, social anxiety disorders, there now that you're not able to drink alcohol, let's treat it with a bit of an antidepressant and some cognitive behavioural therapy, felt a lot better. Chances of remaining absent after transplant, much improved, got his transplant, able to go back and be a father to his children, and actually live and function and work. We also look after people who have psychological sequelae of physical health problems. And if any of the medical students here have heard me speak about this guy before, I'm terribly sorry, but he's still my favourite. And um, this was a man who had a heart attack seven years before I saw him. Huge heart attack. He just dropped one day out of the blue. No past medical history, nothing like that. But he dropped, oh, dreadful. And the physical care he received was exemplary. Utterly wonderful. He was whipped up in an ambulance up to the Bristol Heart Institute and within sort of 15 minutes of arrival he was in an operating theatre and he was having stents put in his heart. Brilliant, absolutely fantastic. His recovery was a bit rocky. He actually had another arrest at some point during this admission where he, they needed to do a full recess with the old CPR and everything. Oh goodness, drama, drama. It's very casualty. Um, but he recovered from that again and within a few days was fit enough to go home. And it was wonderful, it was a lovely story, isn't it? We felt very <laughs> pleased with ourselves, we're excellent, we're very, very clever. And on the way out the door, one of the doctors said to him, do you know what, you've made an excellent recovery, you're so good. Um, you wouldn't have survived if you hadn't been so fit. Well done you. Crack on, discharge. And that's brilliant, but that really stuck with this man. And that had been seven years before I saw him. And in those seven years, he had exercised for 14 to 16 hours a day, every day. He had been unable to leave his house where he had a treadmill to go anywhere except a hotel that had a 24-hour gym because he had to exercise so often and he was going to die if he didn't. He had been unable to pick up his um, grandchildren because he thought, strain on the heart, don't want that, badness. And a couple of weeks after he had been discharged from hospital, he was down in Broadmead and he was on like a... Um, an escalator going in a department shop and as he went on one escalator up someone a woman wearing the same perfume as the nurse who had led the arrest in hospital went down and it triggered a flashback which gave them this huge panic attack and the poor man collapsed at the top of the escalator again and when you feel panic you guys have all felt panic you get short of breath and sweaty and clammy and dizzy and sometimes even chest pain I wonder why people think they're having a heart attack when they have a panic attack. And so this whole thing had re-traumatised them over again. So for seven years, he hadn't picked up his kids. He hadn't slept properly. He was exercising 14 hours a day. He couldn't go to Upper Maudlin Street or anywhere near the Heart Institute. And he couldn't go to Broadmead because these were the places where the trauma happened. And he had to come back as part of a study. We made him come back to the hospital every year. And for three weeks leading up to that appointment, he wouldn't sleep, he would have nightmares, he wouldn't eat properly, and he was anxious all the time, waiting to come back and be re-traumatised. And it was only because a really wonderful and lovely nurse um, had come to uh, one of our sort of teaching sessions about psychiatry and anxiety, um, had said to him during one of these checkups, Dan, you look a wee bit anxious, how is everything? And he just went, woo! <laughs> So she asked, him to see it, she asked us to see him, so we were able to pop up and see him and have a chat, unleash this whole can of worms, and we referred him on to cognitive behavioural therapy, and within six sessions of cognitive behavioural therapy, he was able to stand in the wards of the Bristol Heart Institute, a place that he'd avoided for seven years, and he was able to stand there, manage the panic, not think he was having a heart attack. How cool is that? 
And it reminds me that when we're doctors and when we're nurses, and for everybody else in a position of authority, the things we say out of the best of intentions, out of kindness, out of hope, out of everything else, for some folk, just some folk, they can resonate and really, really cause extraordinary sequelae. Just extraordinary. So I'm not asking people not to say, well done, eh, you wouldn't have survived if you hadn't been so fit. But just for us to check afterwards, your heart's fine, but how's the rest of you cracking on? And then, one of my favourite groups of people, complex patients. I have an outpatient clinic and I have um, some inpatients as well. And basically, one of the referral criteria to come and see me is, do you have more than six volumes of medical notes? Because I tell you what, if you've got more than six volumes of medical notes, you're either chronically unwell, in which case that's a massive risk factor for a whole pile of mental health problems, come and see me, or we've not managed to find out why you're unwell. And you've just been going around specialist after specialist after specialist, in which case, if you weren't broken before, you are going to be now, may as well come and see me and see if there's anything we can do to help sort this out. Because doctors and nurses, we are absolutely fantastic, but we can hurt you. You can hurt us, but we can hurt you too. So this idea of complex patients, I absolutely love. My clinic's full of them. Now, here's my other area of interest. Medically unexplained symptoms. Because I know you're not going to believe this, but we don't have all the answers, eh? And medically unexplained symptoms for me is this incredibly broad category with really... Well, what does it cover? It covers symptoms that we can't figure out an obvious unifying diagnosis. We can't do a house on it. We can't figure out what's caused every part of them. And there's a big spectrum of what causes that. And at one end, there's things like fictitious disorder, Munchausen's, where people consciously fabricate a whole range of symptoms. No wonder we can't find a cause for them. They are doing it consciously. They are lying to us to elicit care, how rubbish their life must be. And then at the very far end, we've got another group of symptoms which there is a unifying diagnosis for. We've just not found it yet. We've, we don't know what it is. And in the middle is the great swathe of humanity where your mental state influences your bodily reactions and your perceptions of your symptoms. That seems a bit odd to lots of people. And when they get referred to my clinic, I have to spend quite a lot of time saying, we don't think you're making it up. We don't think it's all in your head. But it's more like an acknowledgement of what happens outside in your world affects how you feel and that affects your symptoms, your physical symptoms. And if anyone doubts that that is the truth, think about the last time that somebody said, oh, you've got an exam on Monday, oh, or you've got a driving test, oh, or something bad has happened. And you, start, you hear the news, you adopt it to your emotional state, you think, bugger. Then you start to panic. Then you start to get that sort of the taste, the, the horrible taste of adrenaline at the back of your throat. You can feel your heart racing. You can get that sweatiness again. And then you need to go to the toilet. Um, for medical students, we have a horrible experiment in second year where we play this game with people at a whole year teaching day where we say that any medical <coughs> student, we're going to pick a name out of the hat and you've got to come up and explain the Krebs cycle, this horrifically complex biochemical cycle in front of the whole year. And then we can see people going, oh, don't blame me, I would as well. I couldn't explain the Krebs cycle to save my life. But that idea that we can elicit physical reactions in you by telling you something, by changing your emotional state, that's what happens in medically unexplained symptoms. And it's a whole lot more complex than anxiety. And it's a whole lot more complex than um, anything that I can possibly explain. But that doesn't mean to say that your physical symptoms aren't directly and badly associated with a poor mental state. It doesn't mean that you're depressed. It doesn't mean that you're anxious. It doesn't mean anything else. It means that the way you think about your symptoms can affect them. And the way we react to them can affect them. And trying to work that out with patients who've been seeing lots and lots and lots of different specialties, specialties is really, really tricky sometimes. God, it's tricky for me to try and get my head around it. But what I can tell you is there's an intricate and almost infinite number of complex physiological and biochemical pathways that all interact between your mind, your brain and your body. And if we change one of them, we can, with a bit of luck, change the others. And that is something that we've known for millennia. We know that emotions influence your physical state. We call it things like heartache, heartbreak, butterflies in your stomach. We use somatic physical terms for these emotional states, but we seem to have forgotten it recently. 
And one of the reasons I would hypothesise in Western medicine we've forgotten it is because we've learned so much about the complexity of the rest of the body that one brain can only hold so much. So the doctor can only possibly be a specialist in cardiology and then in the, the electrophysiology of cardiology and the electrophysiology of one particular node of the heart in cardiology. They don't have enough knowledge to know everything else. How can you? And that's why being a liaison psychiatrist is utterly brilliant. Because I'm not good at anything. I'm not good at anything. Don't have to be. Just have to be a bit curious about loads of things. And I have to have the phone numbers of all the experts. That's all I need. And that's what makes it utterly wonderful to work in that sort of sphere. To work with these patients who come in and say, I've got 17 volumes of notes and no one's found out what's wrong with me. And I go, well, I'm not entirely sure I will either. Don't know. But what I can do is not hurt you. What I can do is not start anything else. What I can do is try not to diagnose you with anything else more funky. But we can talk about all of the other things that these physical symptoms mean to you. And if we can change that, maybe we can actually change the physical symptoms. Doesn't that sound cool? Yeah, we're changing people through talking to them. That's marvellous. So that sort of care sounds like it should cost a lot. Sounds like having a whole team of psychiatrists and nurses and psychologists and psychotherapists roaming around hospitals, touching people and listening to them and talking to them. It sounds like it should cost stuff. And the NHS is constantly banging on about costs. Hands up who thinks it feels like psychiatry, ladies and psychiatry, should cost money. Strong, and I'm appreciating the interjection there. Excellent, good, good. Anybody else, Esther, you think it should? Nice, okay. Um, so, hands up who thinks it would probably be cost neutral. Nice, excellent, good. Hands up who thinks it would save money. Ha oh, ha, you're far ahead of me. Um, so, yes, it does. This is one of these wonderful interventions where excellent, high quality care actually saves money. And it's wonderful because um, we've got like evidence and everything, it's good. There's the poster boy of um, liaison psychiatry for a long while is a guy called Professor George Tardos, who's very lovely. I've not met him, but I know people who have, and they say he's lovely. And he did this really funky thing. He looked at the hospital in Birmingham, and he started measuring something easily measurable, which is the length of stay of patients in the hospital in Birmingham, and he got an average length of stay. And at that point, they had a fairly normal nine to five liaison psychiatry team. And then somehow he managed to get like a million pounds, I imagine out of charisma, um, from people to build a 24 hours a day, seven days a week liaison psychiatry team, ageless, seeing everyone from 18 up to end of life. And then he looked at the length of stay again. And here's something interesting. The length of stay of the patients that the liaison psychiatry team, this RAID model, rapid access um, model, so they didn't change very much because they would have been seen by the ordinary liaison team before the trial started. But it was the rest of the hospital, all of the patients that we didn't see, all of the patients who were on the wards with the patients that we did see, their length of stay shrunk dramatically. And they called that the RAID influence group. And through that RAID influence group and looking at the economic cost of increased length of stay as well as um, readmissions to hospital after discharge, they estimated, the London School of Economics estimated that for every pound spent in liaison psychiatry we saved four. That's a conservative estimate. It was one to seven at one point. And that's just about the stuff we can measure. They didn't look at medically unexplained symptoms. They didn't look at reducing investigations. They didn't look at trying to keep people out of hospital with a care plan um, for the self harm. They didn't look at stopping liver transplants. They didn't look at any of that. They just looked at the length of stay of usually the elderly group of patients in the hospital. And they saw it shrink under the RAID influence group. And why is that? Because it's the culture. And this is what really gets me quite excited about liaison psychiatry, because you can see I'm usually a calm person, right? We can change the culture of a hospital. We can help change the culture of an incredibly complex system that looks after you guys 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And sometimes, when I've spoken to friends who um, are interested in evaluating culture change and evaluating system change, what they say to me is, well, you've got to stop, then you change the system and then you evaluate it again. And you're like, can't stop, can't shut the emergency department. Folk keep turning up, keep turning up unwell, have to keep treating them as we keep changing things. 
But if, with a little incremental approach, we can help change things, then we can see over time a massive difference in the way that my colleagues, my wonderful, fantastic physician and surgeon and nursing colleagues in the general hospital treat, think and discharge patients, discharge us. And this is really cool because every so often something happens that makes you think, oh, all of that lovely teaching and training and stuff was worthwhile. And one of this happened a few months ago when a gentleman came in with sudden bilateral hearing loss. Couldn't hear anything. And he did all the investigations, couldn't find anything wrong. And someone, a physician who'd been at some of our teaching, at some of our talking about this, had thought, I wonder if it's conversion disorder. And conversion disorder is one of, that, one of the broad umbrellas of medically unexplained symptoms where something traumatic, psychologically traumatic happens and a whole system of the body shuts down. So um, people lose the ability to walk, people can't see, people can't hear. And it's not so common now because it doesn't fit in with our cultural narrative of how illness works, but you still see it every so often. And this guy had been having really, really, really horrible phone calls, threatening phone calls, and it's like his brain had said, had enough, bugger this for a game of soldiers, stop it, and they just made him deaf. And what was interesting was he behaved like a deaf person or what he thought a deaf person would be like. He doesn't know sign language, what is this? <laughs> he can speak perfectly well, he was able to form sentences 24 hours ago, but now he's behaving like a deaf person because in his mind and for him he is deaf. And so after all the normal investigations, this very, very clever physician said, look, I'll um, it's so very stressful for you, so I'll ask the psychiatrist to come and see you. Um, but actually, I can reassure you that nothing big, horrible or nasty is going on. You're not going to die of this. And I've seen this before, and it gets better in about 12 to 24 hours. And by the time I came to see him the next morning, he'd recovered hearing in his right ear. Because the treatment for conversion disorder is recognition, reassurance, and a good prognosis, quick as you like. And that gets a lot of people better very quickly without doing them any more damage. And so when I saw this guy at the end of the bed and he was saying, my, no, my hearing's a bit better now, actually. I thought, oh, that couldn't be happy. I couldn't be happy. And I was very happy for him, but I was also really happy that we'd made that cultural change, that we'd got somebody who otherwise might have been into a whole pile of investigations, all of which have side effects and horribleness and cost, um, but we'd been able to say, no, just reassure him, it'll be fine. That cheers me up. I love getting phone calls from departments in the hospitals to say, we've had a really, really horrible um, thing happen in our ward or department. It's been really traumatic and everyone's upset. Can you come and just have a chat and do a debrief? I don't need to do a debrief. It requires absolutely no psychiatric skill whatsoever to sit in a room and go, God, that sounds really horrible, but you're all doing ever so well. But somehow it seems to make a difference and it allows people to talk, other doctors, nurses, um, to talk about their feelings and how hard the job is sometimes and get up in the morning to come and do it again the next day because you can't stop. There's people coming in the front door all the time. You can't just stop and have a bit of a bobble. You can't do a Columbo when you're the doctor or the nurse. And when we're on the wards, when we're doing all of that, we can help the doctors and the nurses love our patients. We can help them say, God, this is fantastic, isn't it? What a wonderful story this person's come in with. Not just a, I'll fix their leg, I'll fix their heart, and then my job's done. And I find that immensely rewarding. So we're getting near the end, and I'm going to tell you a story. And I wondered whether to tell you the story. But Rachel, again, I can see you as well, Brid. I'm sorry, but I've not had enough chance to speak to you to, get, to pick your brains and basically use all your work um, in this talk. But I was telling Rachel the story, and she said, no, you should tell it. Hello, <laughs> okay. I don't know if any of us come off well in this, except my friend Amy, who's an excellent psychiatrist, but we'll, we'll crack on with it and see what you think. I knew something was amiss this day when I came in. I was a registrar at the time, not yet a consultant. And I came into the office and we listened to the answer machine and there was just a series of increasingly distressed phone messages from a ward. It started off with a, please come and see this person urgently when you come in to, please come and see them now, to, you've got to come, you've got to come. So Amy, my colleague, and I were, um, were standing there listening to it. I think I was nominally in charge that day. So we listened to it and I said, oh, you better go up there quickly because I'm not a good person. And I thought, I'm not going up there by myself. We'll send Amy, she's excellent. I said, I'll be up there as soon as you like, I'll follow you up. So Amy, shh, she said to me, but she went up to the ward. And I did the morning meeting or whatever I had to do and I followed her up there. And what happened was this woman, probably early 20s, had come into hospital overnight with some abdominal pain. 
and as was the want, she'd been seen by the surgeons who didn't know what was going on with her, so admitted her. And then she deteriorated over the next few hours, becoming more and more agitated, um, saying that she didn't know where she was, trying to get out of bed, and then eventually doing really, really horrible things like trying to hang herself on one of the cords in the corner of the room. But no, there was nursing staff there, they stopped her and they put her back to bed and then they got extra nursing staff in to look after her because she was so agitated and she was so distressed and nobody knew what was going on with her. And so by the time Amy had gone up in the morning to see her, she was writhing in bed with these sort of two or three nurses holding her down and no clear cause for it whatsoever. Medical unexplained symptoms, right? And um, I don't know what I would have done, but Amy fortunately is a better psychiatrist and doctor than me. And she had looked at the past medical history, none. Past BRI notes, none. And then she'd looked um, at the date of birth and where she had been living and she somehow managed to track down this woman's general practitioner, the GP surgery, and she phoned them up and said, do you know anyone of this name, Anne Smith? And they went, no, 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 no. But what's their date of birth? So Amy gave them their date of birth and said, I think I know who she is. I'll send you through a care plan, a set of instructions about how best to handle somebody in any situation. So by that time I was on the ward and we watched this fax come through from the GP surgery and it said... Um, this woman's name isn't whatever you think it is, it is Susan Jones. Um, she's got factitious disorder. She consciously manufactures symptoms and signs to elicit care and be admitted to hospital. She's well known to the police and have been prosecuted for this because it's a crime against the resources of the NHS. We've tried psychotherapy, it doesn't work. Medication doesn't work. Detention under the Mental Health Act doesn't work. Admission to hospital doesn't work. Admission to a psychiatry hospital doesn't work. She's really well known to us and the best thing you can do to stop you hurting her anymore is to tap her on the shoulder, say, hello, it's Susan, isn't it? Probably time to go home now and hope she leaves. Yours sincerely. <laughs> and Amy and I looked at this and I was like, oh God, this is a nightmare. Now at this point, poor junior doctors are crying. One of them is scared. It's all night shifts like this. I was like, no, darling, they're not. Nurses are threatening to resign. Surgeons are shouting the odds. Something must be done. Something must be done. And Amy and I are reading this fax. Juge, 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 come out of the machine. So I said to Amy, do you want to? And she went, no, you've screwed me enough today. It's your job to go and do this. So I wandered into the room with Amy, thankfully. This patient lying on bed, three nurses in the room, all holding her down, whole corridor full of nurses and doctors and surgeons screaming and shouting. I've been really, really upset and traumatized by this outside. Gird your loins, deep breath, hand on the shoulder. Hello, it's Susan, isn't it? Mm. I think you're having a hard time now. Probably time to go home. She's lying on this ground. And that, as I said, that she's like, oh, yep, okay. Um, swung her legs off her bed, got up, pulled her jeans on. Uh, right, thanks very much. Got my keys, got my phone, got my purse. Anyone phoning me a taxi? <laughs> no, no one's phoning me a taxi. And as she left, she like, asked me, she said, do you want to be my psychiatrist? I thought, no, no, I don't think I do. <laughs> You're too big for me. So she left. She wandered down the corridor, past all the frightened nurses, past the anxious and traumatised juniors, past the angry surgeons, saying, thanks very much, see you later, thanks everybody, thanks, and wandered out. And as we walked her wandering down the corridor, Amy turned to me and said, we look like magicians. <laughs> And it was quite literally the coolest I have ever been in my entire life. And she's right. We looked absolutely fantastic. We wandered in there, two scared psychiatry doctors that became out goddesses, queens of all we surveyed. So the point of this talk was, um, I wanted to convince you that ladies in psychiatry can change the world. And okay, maybe I haven't convinced you that we can change the world, but I tell you what, if we can convince surgeons that we're magicians, if we can avoid liver transplants, if we can make somebody want to live by being kind to them, if we can help change somebody from a completely traumatised, dysfunctional, anxious man after a heart attack to be able to live and to be able to work, if we can do all that while we are saving money in the NHS, then we might not be able to change the world. We will definitely save patients and the NHS and the money and probably you as well. Thank you very much.